What's going on, guys? Welcome back into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Taglier. As you can probably tell, Bobby's not with me today. That's likely due to the fact that I've now beat him in like four straight mock drafts, but he says he's got some baseball stuff to do. I I don't even know what that means anymore. Here, We are all about football all the time. And today, we are kicking off the 2019 NFL Draft coverage, providing you with an overview of the draft class at each skill position. And remember, guys, there are going to be individual episodes on each position going forward. We're going to dissect the players a lot more thorough, and we might name a team or two that's going to be interested in the draft, where they might go in the draft, and, you know, what it would mean for fantasy football. But today is just to give you guys an overview of the draft class to know which positions are deeper, which ones might be a little bit shallow. Uh, Today is basically just to get your feet wet and understand which positions are deep and which ones aren't. Uh, All right, so let's get started. Wait, you didn't you didn't really think that the bosses were going to actually let me go and host this episode myself, did you? I mean, they were legitimately concerned that I'd found my Calvin Ridley of this draft class and that I was going to talk about him for an hour straight. No. Instead, we've brought in R.C. Fisher from FantasyFootballMetrics.com. You can follow him on Twitter at FFMetrics and myself at Mike Taglier NFL. R.C., thank you for joining the show today. Well, thanks for having me, and I'm sure the bosses are even more concerned when they found out who your guest was this week. So, <laughs> Yeah, both of us are apparently pretty long-winded, uh, so we're, <laughs> we're going to try and keep the show to uh, to an hour today. That's like that's our goal that we're setting out. So we're covering two players. Great. Pretty much. I mean, that can happen. I swear to God, it's happened uh, before, but uh, today, obviously, we're going to try and get through. We're going to try and limit it to roughly about a minute a player just to get through them all uh, so you guys can get an idea of the draft class, but uh, before we do get into the show, I'd like to tell you about our signed Amari Cooper Cowboys helmet giveaway. We are going to be picking a winner for this one on Friday, March 15th, so you might as well enter as soon as you can. It only takes 30 seconds to enter. You can go to fantasypros.com forward slash contest for more details. Guys, again, 30 seconds to enter. We also want to thank Pristine Auction for giving us this helmet to give away to you guys. And guys, make sure to go check out pristineauction.com. I literally just ordered a new helmet the other day. I got a Rob Gronkowski signed helmet. They have daily auctions there, ending nightly with hundreds of lots. There is so much stuff that you can get for your man cave. Even if it's not for you, it's great for a gift. There is a perfect gift for a fan of any team, any player. I kid you not. They actually had a Kevin White signed helmet that I debated getting for Bobby back around Christmas time. On top of that, they guarantee the authenticity of all items. It comes from only the most trusted sources. And best of all, it's affordable. Most people don't think that they could afford this stuff, but it is much more affordable than you think. It is quick. It's free to register. It's free to bid. You only pay when you win. I mean, that's the idea after all. All we ask that you guys, when you go there, they're going to ask you, how did you hear about us? Let them know that Fantasy Pros sent you so we can keep doing giveaways like the Amari Cooper signed helmet that we're giving away right now. So guys, go check it out, pristineauction.com. That is P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, auction.com. This is where we're going to start talking some NFL draft guys. So considering how important the running back position is to fantasy football, let's just start there. So, you know, I'm going to throw out some running back names and I want you to give me like, give me the the top choice of the two. I'm going to go by twos here. David Montgomery, Josh Jacobs, which one do you like more? Well, that one would be an easy choice for me. I would take Josh Jacobs not to be, for the most part, I see him ranked as the number one running back uh, on most mock draft websites, um, various places uh, in the early stages. So I hate to be in agreement with the rest of society, but right now, Josh Jacobs isn't my top running back, but if you're giving me a choice between he and David Montgomery, I will take Jacobs, mostly because Montgomery just doesn't do it for me. Every time I watched him on tape or looked at his numbers, his real weak yards per carry, it's just not a lot to him. He's okay. Looks like a lesser uh, Alvin Kamara, not a, a not as exciting Alvin Kamara. But Josh Jacobs seems to be a little bit more money than David Montgomery. So if you're making me choose between those two, I'll take Josh Jacobs. Yeah, Josh Jacobs is the consensus one here. He's he's the guy at top draft boards. He's the one that you're going to see going in one zero one in a lot of dynasty drafts. And, you know, he's a three down running back. I really can't fault him. But when it comes to the running back position, I really don't like like and this is I know it's obviously my job to do this and I'm going to have to do it. But I don't like ranking players before I know where they're at, because I think coaching matters, scheme matters, all that stuff matters. And, you know, like someone like Josh Jacobs can fit into a three down role and he's probably going to be the 
best fantasy asset. Whereas someone like David Montgomery, more of a power runner, uh, downhill runner, he doesn't, you know, he's going to get those yards after contact. And it really just comes down to scheme fit. And there's, you know, there's not really too many teams that need a workhorse running back. A lot of teams are going to those timeshares. But now I'm really curious. Now I'm really, you said that neither of them are your number one running back, which I'm just going to go off script here and say, which one is your number one running back? Uh, before I reveal that name, as you're talking about opportunities for these running backs, that's that's such a huge thing uh, this particular year because you're right, there's not that many spaces where you, you look through the teams and you go, who really needs a running back? I mean, who really needs one? And then you're going to have a bunch of running backs, talented running backs in free agency to fill those roles. So there's not a lot of places for these guys to go, but I, I want to preface it all, all uh, the running back talk from my perspective saying, I think this is possibly one of the worst running back classes that I've scouted uh, in a, a couple of years. There's some talent there. Are, there's a lot of guys that will, that can hang in the league. It's not devoid of talent, but on the top side, there's no Gurley, David Johnson, Saquon Barkley. There's no guys that just jump out. The fact that we're, you know, that Josh Jacobs is the consensus number one is surprising, not surprising, and not exciting. If Josh Jacobs was on Mississippi State and had the same touch counts and had the same production, I don't know that anybody would care, and he'd be probably be outside the top five or top ten. I think some of that he's Alabama is pushing him to the number one spot. I'm glad you brought that up. Now that you mention it, okay, so Josh Jacobs, for those of you who don't know, he was splitting touches at Alabama. He didn't receive very many touches. He has limited tread on his tires. But the fact that he plays for Alabama actually worries me more. Like, and a lot of people mention what you say. If he played for Mississippi State, he'd be falling in drafts further. But the reason, like, Alvin Kamara, where he played in college and where Jacobs played in college, Kamara was lightly used. Yeah, and a lot of people are using that as a comp, but... I mean, guys, he played for Saban. Saban knows what he's doing. And so to me, it's like, you know, is there a reason that Damian Harris was on the field as much as he was? I, I feel like Josh Jacobs, maybe he's a better running back in a timeshare. Maybe he wouldn't look as good if he was getting 20 touches per game. I can't answer that. But doesn't it worry you a little bit more because he did play for Saban? For me, there's a natural dislike of anything Alabama because everything is so over the top pro Alabama. There's it's almost by default when you look at you know February draft rank, January February uh, pre combine draft rankings, and it doesn't even matter to the position. If you went to Alabama, you're going to get if you're anything if you have any talent at all, you're probably going to be jammed into the top five, and if you're pretty good, you're probably be jammed in at the number one spot uh, in your position. So my instant reaction before I even start studying these guys is when I see the Alabama guys, I get kind of uh, I get my back up a little bit and go, I'm going to have to go in and debunk these guys i'm not going to go in and see something special i'm probably going to be more backing up on them so from that perspective it scares me and just that alabama is so good it's such a great place you know david montgomery getting stuck in at iowa state he had these low yards per carries the last couple of years i'm not completely sure if you took montgomery and put him on alabama well if he if david montgomery was on alabama he'd probably be the number two running back in the draft class just because he's at alabama but maybe he would have had a better had more productivity, better yards per carry if he was on Alabama. Vice versa, you put Josh Jacobs on Iowa State. Do we even, you know, is he outside the top five? So there's there's that Alabama perspective. And then there's the other perspective of, yes, he did go to Alabama. So when he goes into the NFL, you and I can go, well, this is ridiculous. But he goes to the NFL and they love the Alabama. So Josh Jacobs is going to get jammed in uh, to touches where David Montgomery might get totally ignored uh, because of who went to Alabama and who didn't. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. All right. So who's the number one back? My number one running back, I think in this very weak class of uh, on the top side where there's not a guy where you're like, especially for fantasy where you go, wow, this guy's going to change the world for fantasy and it won't even matter who he's drafted by. Like I agree with you, Josh Jacob, probably everybody we're going to talk about today. We could say, depending on where he goes, depending on where he goes, the one guy that I think could break that trend that is so above the rest of the group in just terms of, uh, electricity and raw talent, and he's not at every down uh, back, is um, Trivion Williams from Texas A&M, I think is the best running back talent out there for this particular draft class. But he's not going, he's not going to go be a 20 carry a game guy and, and lead a backfield and get every touch. Uh, he's going to be more 
probably a split role. He's five nine, two hundred pounds, more like a bigger Philip Lindsay. So, but the his, his footwork, his agility, the way that he can move away from players. I, I've watched all these, all the running backs that have gone to the NFL Combine, and then some from guys to the college All Star games. I've seen a lot of tape on all these running backs. And I've and I've done this for a decade. So I watch these guys over and over. And guys like a Josh Jacobs or a David Montgomery almost half fall asleep because I've seen this before. I've seen this before. Rare is a guy where I kind of jump back and go, "Wow, that there's something different here." And uh, Trevion Williams is is the only guy in this class where I was watching a running back going, "Wow, that that is a rare physical gift of a running back." Wow, that's something. So the thing is, is like he's expected to go on day three. So that's kind of like a sleeper pick. So that's like someone who's not being mentioned in even the first round of Dynasty draft picks uh, right now. Um, so, but they, maybe that name catches steam after the combine. Uh, I've only seen two. I was just looking at my notes. I've only watched two games on him so far. Uh, so I'm not going to comment too much on him. I don't like commenting on players until I've watched at least at least four games because I just feel like I'm not. I'm doing myself and you guys a disservice uh, if I comment on those players. I haven't gotten like that deep into day three yet, and that's the thing is like. Does that mean he should go in day three? No, it doesn't. There's players that have been drafted, undrafted, uh, that turn into superstars. So I don't want to, I'm not going to shun that, but I'm definitely going to take a closer look now that you mentioned it. I like Daryl Henderson from Memphis quite a bit. Uh, the more I watched him, it seems like the, the longer that the game went on, the better he got. He could play in an eye formation. He could play in a shotgun. I feel like there's a lot to like there. Uh, another few names I'm going to mention in that sentence are Rodney Anderson out of Oklahoma. He's obviously dealt with a lot of injuries. It seems like every single year he's dealt with an injury. He's coming into the draft. He's like, you know what? I'm just not going to risk it anymore. And then Bryce Love out of Stanford. Bryce Love is someone that if he would have come out last year, it's like, you know, he probably would have been, with the way that running backs were being drafted, he would have been a first-round pick. And now, he a very, very disappointing 2018. You know, which one of these running backs are you most excited about? You, you know, do you feel like Bryce Love is worth the risk over guys like a Daryl Henderson or a Rodney Anderson? Uh, I'm not excited about any of the three of them. And if I, I would take Daryl Henderson uh, of the three and somewhat by the process of elimination of the other two guys, when I look at Rodney Anderson, I see the size. I don't see any special type of running skills, runs a little soft for, he's one of the rare, you know, there's not as many uh, 220 plus pound uh, top running back prospects this year. So he's got the advantage of being a bigger guy. I think he benefited quite a bit a couple of years ago, just being in and around the Baker Mayfield offense. And when Baker left uh, in 2018, it was a little dip back for Anderson. I, I just don't, I didn't see much in his running style. I, I don't see that he's anything more than a C D grade uh, running back for the NFL, a dime a dozen guy. Uh, Bryce Love, I think was, I, I thought he was a fraud when I looked, you know, when he was the uh, gaining a lot of enthusiasm two seasons ago, I did a little bit of a preview just to see who this guy was and I, I didn't get it. And then watching him again, Again, this year, he's just he he looks. You know, Philip Lindsay's breaking the stereotype of what smaller running backs can do in the NFL. But Bryce Love just looks too small and mo does most of his work between the tackles in college. And I don't think at his size and his running style, he's not. I don't think he's ultra fast. Uh, he gets caught from behind way too much. So it's not like he's a four three guy. He, I didn't see a ton of agility. There's no. You know, physicality to his running style, but you can get away in college. You're, you know, you're roughly a 200 pound back with a little bit of speed and you play behind a Stanford offense and line. You might have big seasons like that, but I think when it, it translates to the NFL, I think he's going to have nothing but problems because he's not going to be able to run between the tackles like he did in college. I kind of always think of him and I think of Ronald Jones. Similar guys are good in college, uh, good between the tackles, not that big of guys, but can can work between the tackles on a top college team and then they get to the pros and they just get con totally stuffed because it's a whole different world up at the next level. So I think Bryce Love's going to have that even worse Ronald Jones experience at the next level. Wow. So we're going to definitely get into uh, Bryce Love's going to be a very polarizing uh, draft prospect as we go through everything. And I don't want to get it too much into today because otherwise we're going to miss a lot of names that I want to talk about. Uh, but Bryce Love, I, I actually, the, the comp I came up with, and uh, you know, some people are talking about his ankle injury affecting him this season. He kind of reminds me a lot of Chris Johnson and Chris Johnson was someone that some people considered a fraud as well. And like, it was like, he had those moments where it's like, he shows those moments where he hits 
hits that hole, he plants that foot in the ground. Some are expecting him to run, you know, maybe a high 4-3, a low 4-4. And if he gets there, it's like, I, I see teams taking a shot, but uh, I don't I don't even know. I don't think he's running at the Combine. I think he's going to go through the athletic drills, but uh, we'll be covering that next week in the Combine episode. But um, I don't want to spend too much time here. Moving down the list a little bit, Devin Singletary is someone that a lot of people are talking about. A lot of people are loving the the agility, his elusiveness. Uh, I don't know if he's built to be an every down back in the NFL. You have Miles Sanders following in the footsteps of Saquon Barkley at Penn State. He looked good at times, not so good at others. Uh, and then Bobby's favorite, which I, I, him and I disagreed on this one, hands down. So, I mean, you can be the tiebreaker on this. Benny Snell out of Kentucky, I don't like him. I feel like he's the definition of just a guy. Maybe a, maybe he can handle a workload, maybe a little bit above average, but I don't – he reminds me kind of like a Sean Green. Like, I just don't feel the need to draft someone like that. Uh, so, what's your thoughts on Miles Sanders, Devin Singletary, and Benny Snell? Uh, before I hit on those three, just to jump back, just one real quick. Uh, I picked Daryl Henderson by default of the uh, prior three, but I, I too am a fan of Henderson's running style. I don't, th- I don't think he's going to test off the charts at the NFL Combine, and he's only about 200 pounds. But there's something about him, watching him, that he's a distinctive or a different type of running style. He's tough. Uh, he finds his way through the holes better than most of the running backs uh, prospects this year. He's just one of those guys you're not going to think much of when you look at him uh i mean Devontae freeman or something along those lines but then all of a sudden he's you know he he gets his chance he probably won't get a chance on purpose and then when he gets this chance he'd be like wow this guy really is productive so i wouldn't go out of my way to draft him uh if i'm on an nfl team i don't know if i go out of my way to draft him for fantasy because it's going to take a little while before he, he probably gets his opportunity but i i, I kind of like um what daryl henderson brings to the table uh, of the three uh, S running backs here, um, let me take, I'm going to leave uh, Singletary for last. I, I think Miles Sanders is one of the lowest uh, graded guys I have at the com- among the combine running backs. I just didn't see anything uh, too exciting with Sanders was tentative. There's no real size to him, no power. I mean, he's, he's athletic enough. A lot of these guys are athletic enough. They'll run into four or fives, you know, give or take, uh, and could hang in the NFL. But I don't think Miles Sanders, I don't know if he'll get drafted, but I don't think he's going to make, from a fantasy perspective, we're not going to look back and go, wow, remember when they drafted Miles Sanders? He's just going to be a guy that we forget about in a year. Uh, to break your tie on Benny Snell, I don't get it at all. Um, I, I don't see it. I don't know why he's rated as highly as he is. I mean, I know this this draft is lacking in 220 plus pound talent because uh, there almost isn't any uh, this year. But I mean, he just looks like a big guy uh, that da- tries to dance around too much and he's not a very good dancer so i mean he's big so he's gonna plow over some some college guys uh but i think i think he ends up running closer to four six and then his three cones going to be seven one seven two seven three and then that'll be the end of benny snell if he if he has some radical numbers i'll change my tune but But people love that production the college man they follow it geez every one of these guys there's not there's not any one of these guys that isn't you know Uh uh, that if they were given the workload you know didn't run for a thousand yards uh and close to double digit touchdowns but then that leaves the ultimate production guy Devin Singletary, 54 touchdowns the last two seasons. And when I saw that, I was like, eh, you know, at Florida Atlantic, you look at his size, he's 200 pounds. This is going to be a waste of my time. And the first time I kind of watched some preview tape, I thought, yep, there really isn't much here. Then as we got into this year, getting ready for the combine, and I started looking at him more games in more detail, I I started to fall in like, I won't say love, but I started to fall in like uh, pretty hard uh, for Singletary. He's probably, of all of the guys in this year's draft class, he's probably the most gifted, intuitive runner. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be the best athlete. Uh, he probably is not going to be. He's not going to run off the charts. His agility is not going to be anything spectacular. Uh, his size is just average, but there's a toughness that he runs with. There's a balance. He, I, I don't think anybody in this class takes hits and stays upright uh, and keeps going like Singletary does. There's something, when you score 54 touchdowns in two seasons at a small school, uh, it can be a bit of a, you know, luck of the draw, but with him, 
you like you know a lot of it is because he's pretty ta- he's a pretty talented guy and he can find his way through traffic you know it's like the opposite of Bryce Love if I'm going to draft a 200 pound running back in the NFL to work between the tackles I'm going with Singletary over a Bryce Love just from watching their running styles on tape but Singletary kind of reminded me of a, a bigger Philip Lindsay um, for this year's draft. So I'm starting to become a fan of Singletary. Yeah, no, the size comp for Devin Singletary is actually like a James White, Amir Abdullah uh, type build so that so that people get a visual in their mind. Uh, that's what he's at right now. And he might even actually come in smaller than the listed 5'9 that I have. Um, I'm seeing 5'7 in some places. That's that's. I don't think he's that small. Um, but I, when I was watching his tape, I kind of felt like some of the tackles that he bounced off, it seemed like it was more weak tackling than it was him like breaking tackles. So again, when you talk about Florida Atlantic and the production that he has there, it's like a weaker competition than some of the guys like, you know, like a guy we haven't talked about yet, Damian Harris uh, out of Alabama. And it's just like you, you have to keep that stuff in mind. That's why I like the combine so much is you get you get to see these guys next to each other, you know, side by side. And that's why the combine, it's more than just numbers to me. It's like watching those guys run alongside each other, run routes um, and just see how they handle things you know, on a bigger stage. Uh, so Devin Singletary is definitely someone that interests me. But what about so Damian Harris? The only thing I'll say about him, you know, just really quickly is that he reminds me of Mark Ingram a lot. Um, he's a, a very downhill runner. Um, he's going to get what's blocked for you. I don't think he's going to offer much in the passing game, but I think he can be a competent running back. Like if you're looking for someone like, you know, the Ravens, if they want to wait until the second or third round to draft a running back and they wanted to take Damian Harris, I'd have no issue with that because they're looking for that downhill runner and they really don't involve their running backs in the passing game a whole lot with Lamar Jackson. So, uh, what are your th- quick thoughts on Damian Harris? Uh, quick thoughts on Harris. I'm gonna jump back one quick thing on uh, Singletary. You're talking about the the importance of the combine. It's like at this stage, I like Singletary. But what's so important about the combine is, you know, he runs a four six. I'm out of light. I'm breaking up with him, and I'm not even calling and leaving a message. I'm done. But he runs a four four. Then I then I have to stop and go. Wow, this production, all the things that I saw. Maybe there, you know, there is more here. So uh, the Singletary's combine is going to be uh, huge for me. What his numbers come in at. But to Damian Harris, I I have him as my second number two running back in this draft class at this stage. And I think of the big guys, the, the bigger guys, he's my number one. I'd rather have Harris than uh, Josh. Jacobs, but I'm not, I have the same comp. You said Mark Ingram, uh, he's a faster Mark Ingram, but I have the same notes on him. Here, here, here's the sad state of 2019 bigger running back prospects. Three guys that I have near the top, I had the same little notation when I was first watching them, Mark Ingram, Mark Ingram, Mark Ingram, and I don't like Mark Ingram. So when I'm saying Mark Ingram, Mark Ingram, that's to me, it's like, eh, that's average, you know, Josh Jacobs, Damian Harris, and and Weber from Ohio State. All you know, we're, the top guys are all two hundred and fifteen pounds. That's a really strange year. This is a really strange year for uh, running back, top running back prospects. Because usually you have that one guy that's two hundred twenty five pounds. That's a freak of nature that we can get excited about, even if we shouldn't be excited about them, uh, or they turn out to be a fraud. This year, all the top guys at two hundred and fifteen pounds. It's a very very uh, strange year for the draft prospects. So I like. Uh, every time I've watched Damian Harris, the one thing that's always gripped me that's made me push him a little more over the other 215 pound guys in this class is it just it seemed to me that Harris has a speed, a burst, a gear, an ability to get out of the way and go more than the other guys do. The other guys aren't bust, but there's, there's just been something about the way Damian Harris moves for his size uh, that I thought gave him just a little bit more of an edge in the NFL that he will test that when we come and we see all the agility scores and shuttle scores uh, on these 215 pound guys. I'm thinking that Damian Harris will be the tops amongst them and that will probably push him ahead of Josh Jacobs. But if it's an optical illusion, uh, I'm a tape scout while, you know, while we have tape and before we have the numbers, but as soon as the combine information hits, then I turn into analytics and I try to marry up the tape with analytics. So I'll turn and run or towards or away from any of these uh, eyeball scouting tests. But on the from the eyeball perspective right now, I would say that Harris is probably of the 215 pound or, or bigger running backs. He's my favorite guy. I'm not over the moon with him, but it's the same argument as Josh Jacobs. Where is it because of Alabama he's pushed higher and 
is he, you know, where is he going to, where is he going to land if it's, if he lands in a place that, because most of these guys are probably going to be second round, the best running backs are probably going to be second round uh, draft picks this year. Are they going to be backups? You know, they're going to go to Buffalo and work behind LaShawn McCoy for a year. And then, you know, we're kind of hosed for fantasy on them. So I like Damian Harris. But I'm not in love with Damian Harris. No, that's fair. And that, and I think that's, that's a good spot to wrap up the running back position is just that there's not any, you know, we talk about generational talents. That term is well overused. Generational talent means it's a generational talent. Um, but there's no elite, like, can't miss prospects. I mean, I, some will say that Josh Jacobs is that. There's other people that'll say other players are, but there's not a consensus that where everybody can agree. Like Saquon Barkley, everybody knew he was going to be great. And if there was someone who wasn't, you know, that's probably someone just trying to, you know, go against the flow and try and stand out uh, to everyone else just to just to say it. Just because if Saquon Barkley busts, then obviously he looks smarter because of it. I was going to ask you for a sleeper on day three, but you already gave me Travion Williams. So I think we're going to move on to wide receiver because I do want to make sure we get a lot of receivers here uh, in this episode. Before we do go on to wide receivers, I, I, I want to give a, a tribute to Bobby here. I'd uh, give a scent of Bobby to the show, if you will. Is there an outrageous food take that you have, RC? I wasn't prepared for this question as much as I was prepared for the bathroom etiquette habits <laughs> of politicians. Uh, I, was, I got so many notes on that. This is going in a whole different direction than I expected. Let's see. Food, outrageous food takes. Well, considering that I have the palate and the diet of a petulant six-year-old child that only eats like chicken fingers and slices of cheese uh and dry cheerios uh but i i I don't range very well of eating a variety of foods but i would say the first thing that kind of jumped to my mind uh something i had last night it's something that my wife thinks is bizarre i really enjoy pasta with butter not and i love spaghetti with sauce and all that stuff but there's something about butter and Parmesan cheese on a giant plate of spaghetti that I'd rather have that than sauce or Alfredo or anything else. So I don't know if that's ventures into too bizarre. I actually saw it on a menu the other day for the first time at a real restaurant. But yeah, if my go to if I'm if I'm going out, if this is the final <laughs> appearance on Earth, I'd like a big plate of buttered noodles. Oh, man, we got to get you and Bobby together because uh, Bobby, th- that's his biggest hottest food take is that he eats butter on his pizza. And I lost a bet and I'm going to have to eat that uh, co- <laughs> before this upcoming season. I'm not really looking forward to it because I enjoy pizza and I think butter is just putting a butter on top pizza just doesn't make any sense but you sound like your eating habits are similar to mine where it's like we don't eat anything uh outside of like a third grade level that's what I compare mine to I've been trying to expand lately and you know speaking of food if you guys heard of hello fresh it is fantastic it's a meal delivery service that shops plans and delivers step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook eat and enjoy each week There's a 20-minute meal on the classic menu for you when you really don't have time for more than that. And not just that, you'll feel confident when cooking the meals because HelloFresh will provide you with simple recipes outlined with pictured step-by-step instruction cards. I'm not kidding. It's delivered right to your door in recyclable, insulated packaging. For me, the best part, like the absolute best part, is that you get to spend less time meal planning. My wife and I always talk about, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. What do you want for dinner? You get to eliminate that. You don't have to go to the grocery store each week. You get that time back to do more of what you love, like talk football. Every time I see the HelloFresh box on my porch, I get excited to rip it open and see what recipes have for me this week. I'm trying to expand my horizons, guys. Understand that. Usually, I love a recipe enough that it becomes a staple in our house, and this time, it was the pork meatballs. I cannot believe how much food HelloFresh gives you for each meal. We actually have leftovers, and that's not easy doing with my family. Believe me. For a total of $60 off, that's $20 off your first three boxes, visit HelloFresh.com forward slash pros 60 and enter pros 60. That is P-R-O-S six zero. Again, for a total of $60 off, that's $20 off your first three boxes, visit HelloFresh.com forward slash pros 60 and enter pros 60 for the promo code. Okay, RC, now that we're done talking about food and now that I'm hungry because it's, well, it's nine o'clock in the morning where I am and uh, I'm going to be going to the gym after this. So I just need to get food off the mind for a little bit. Thanks for dropping that in and making us all feel bad. Yeah, it's, uh, well, no, now's the time of the year where I need to get back in shape because like it's not going to happen once football season hits. It's like you're going to add 10 pounds. The combine's coming up. That's why you're hitting the gym. Yeah, combine, that's like where you're 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 huddled up in the house for a few days just kind of watching guys. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, no, let's start right at the top. Big wide receivers. I'm going to throw three of them out there, and I want you to tell me uh, your thoughts on each of them. And uh, maybe pre and post picture of DK Metcalf. Uh, DK Metcalf from Old Miss, my favorite receiver in the draft. Uh, Hakeem Butler out of Iowa State. And then we have Nkeel Harry from Arizona State. These are three bigger wide receivers. Harry isn't... I think he's six two six three, but he's that bigger physical wide receiver. He's not going to do. He's not going to separate much. He's more of like a, a contested catch guy. What do you feel about Metcalf, Butler, and Harry? Uh, before we jump into those three guys, just one quick thing on the overview of the wide receiver class from my perspective. We, when we talked about running backs, I said is one of the worst I've ever seen. Uh, worst off from the top side guys, and and even in that the middle round depth type of guys. It's not, you know, a Royce Freeman. There's not a Royce Freeman type of guy. I think lurking in this year's draft. It's just it's a really weak running back draft. The opposite scale of that is this is the best wide receiver class I think I've ever seen, ever. I know in my 10 years of doing this, if I go further back, then I might be mistaken. There might be a better wide receiver class, but this, this wide receiver group is stunning. I've never given so many pre-grade A's and B's in a wide receiver group in my life. So it, it's one of the wild things about trying to evaluate this wide receiver class for fantasy this year is there's so many great wide receivers. This is going to start turning into where did they land and when all these guys come rushing in, there's a, the flip side of the coin. When all this talent starts rushing into the NFL, what's going to happen to the guys that we think are bulletproof, you know, wide receivers in the NFL? If Nikhil Harry winds up on the Indianapolis Colts, how does that change T.Y. Hilton's destiny? There, there's, it's not like there's just one or two wide receivers and they're going to go and we're going to get excited about it. There might be 10 or 15 guys this year that are going to land places and they're, they're, they're either going to be great them good or great themselves, or they're going to mess up existing wide receivers that we're counting on. So this is an, ex this is going to be a very exciting NFL changing to me wide receiver class. And it's been building for a while, the talent coming from college, but I think, you know, all these passing games from the youth leagues up is starting to catch up where the wide, there's a shift going to guys playing wide receiver over running back. This, this is one of the big years that it's going to pay off where there's just going to be a wide, a grade wide receivers all over. Now, then I'm going to break your heart and say, DK Metcalf is one of my lower graded uh, wide receivers of the top names of this draft class. In, in comparison to Butler and Harry, I think Harry's got the argument to be the number one wide receiver in this draft class. As you were saying, he's not, you know, 6'2", 220. That used to be, wow, that's that's our biggest wide receiver. Now he's, you know, among the top names, that's, that's one of the smaller guys. But I think, like you mentioned, he has that Andre Johnson, just that presence of a number one wide receiver. It's like when you throw him the ball, he's going to catch it. He's going to get open, whether he's using his uh, athleticism, whether he's using his uh, toughness in boxing people out. He just positions himself well uh, to catch passes. Good hands, good size, good athleticism. I like everything about him, and the combine will kind of confirm whether he's an A grade or a B grade. But uh, I'm a growing fan of Harry. I, I love Hakeem Butler because I'm a sucker for you know all of a sudden now we're getting these six foot five guys that aren't just tall stiff guys now we're getting like guys who could have probably played basketball but they're like why should I do I'm gonna go to the NFL and make lots of cash and you know touch the ball just a couple of times a game and make millions Hakeem Butler at 6'5", 225 and just fantastic hands. I would not be surprised if he's the best wide receiver that comes out of this draft class. I don't know that he'll be the, the highest drafted uh, by the NFL. And then, of course, it's where he lands for fantasy. But he's he's someone I've got the big circle on of watching what he does during the combine and where he's going to land. He reminded me of a little better Kenny Galladay uh, with a little bit more size especially what he was able to do in a pretty weak Iowa State passing game. You know, if you put Akeem Butler on, you know, if you would paired him with Baker Mayfield to put him down in Texas Tech, of an, you know, that type of offense, we, you know, he might be everybody's number one. I think he's a little bit buried because he went to Iowa State. No, that's, that's, I mean, that's fair. And the thing is, Butler, to me, like, I feel like he makes some of those catches that y you feel like he shouldn't make. And it's like very contested catches. He can go up and get it. But it's like the, the, the easy ones. I, I've seen him have drops when he tries to catch the ball with his hand 
hands. He's more of like a body catcher than he is a hands guy. Um, like I've been watching so many receivers lately and David Sills is someone who it's like out of West Virginia, natural hands. Like I, I just watch him. He brings the ball in so naturally. He doesn't have to, it's almost like he doesn't even have to focus on the ball. But Butler is someone that's like, there's some mental drops there, um, that I've seen, but there's also things that you see in flashes of someone like AJ Green. You know, it's like, you know, the, the, the body type that he has, that big, long, lanky receiver, and he's really long. You know, if he were able to catch a little bit more with his hands, I think he'd be even a bigger target for his quarterback. And that's just something that I, I definitely like Butler. I, I feel like there are some things that, that scare me a little bit. But what scares you of DK Metcalf? Because, I mean, so many people are talking about this picture. I don't care about the picture. It's easier for my wide receiver to lose weight than it is for him to put on muscle. <laughs> but his burst on tape was was apparent for a guy that's, you know, 6'4", 230 pounds it's like you don't see players that size move the way he did uh the first play I ever seen watching him on film I watched the game versus Alabama first play of the game burns the corner down the sideline on press coverage just got you know a couple yards separation on just like basically just a, a, a go route and it was just uh the burst I, I just don't see that burst every day you cannot teach size and speed that DK Metcalf has are you just concerned that he's too big no I mean like the Alabama game if I remember correctly starts out that game with the big play then you kind of like where DK Metcalf go uh, there was a lot of that in old Miss games my thing with Metcalf is I mean, the athleticism is there is probably similar to the Hakeem Butler argument that you had if you start seeing something you don't like uh, I mean we all love the physicality but then we start seeing some of the nuances uh, of hands and drops and, and the style that they're playing but to me all, all I when I think of Metcalf all, all I remember game after game watching on tape is he's just streaking down the left hand side for bombs and you know at his size and his athleticism I'm sure he's going to test fine there's a place for that in the NFL but I, I didn't I wasn't overwhelmed with his hands I wasn't overwhelmed with his style if he was if he ran any other route besides try to race past the cornerback and go deep I don't know if he's got more gears to his game I started getting worried it's you know it's an easy comp to make to slap on him you know I'm getting worried that I'm watching Laquan Treadwell or a Sammy Coates type of wide receiver where you're like yes the athleticism is there but I don't have a whole lot of other I'm not seeing much else besides guy that's big and races past some people even if he runs in the four threes you, know, you can be fast like Sammy Coates but he's, when you get to the NFL and everybody else is running as fast and you're having to catch contested balls I don't I just don't I haven't seen tape of DK Metcalf where I was going, wow, I can't believe the catches he's making. Wow, look at him working. Like his teammate, uh, A.J. Brown. You know, A.J. Brown has some drops too, but I see him working. A.J. Brown's got a specific style that's going to make him a top wide receiver prospect just because he can work between the hashes. Uh, he's more physical, uh, He's and he's willing to work in traffic. A lot of these wide receivers, whether, you know, this is a great class for wide receivers, but one of the, the things that's going to separate the, the good from the bad is who is comfortable working when the cornerbacks are just as physical and just as fast and keep up with you. And if you have to add other routes to your tree, can you keep up or will you wilt and go away like a LaCron Treadwell has had a problem with that adjustment. So I, I think Metcalf's more on the Sammy Coates side, Laquan Treadwell of what else you got for me. I don't know that you do. You're a one trick pony where AJ Brown is a little bit more. He has some issues, but plays a style that a lot of other guys aren't willing to do. Go over the middle, take hits um, and play a more interior style. Metcalf's definitely a prospect worth debating for this draft but what i i'm surprised that he's universally i don't know how how we just came uh, all uh in agreement that he was the number one prospect there's so many good guys in this draft you would think there'd be a lot of diversity where you know one one group says it's harry one group says it's metcalf one says it's brown one says it's Harmon. you know they, all these different guys i don't know how it, it almost scares me without, if I didn't know anything about football, it scares me in the early stages when everybody's on one wide receiver in January and February, they're usually wrong. So with that uh, great football scouting, I'd say that worries me about Metcalf as well. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, there's a lot of different player types in this draft. And I think Metcalf is the guy that it's like, you look at as that, that prototypical X receiver, that big player that, and the thing is, if he can get open over the top, that's like, that's a bonus for me. 
And that's why I feel like he may be a little bit raw in terms of his routes, but I think, and I don't want to get too far into this because it's like, obviously, you know, we want to get to other players, but AJ Brown being there, DeMarcus Lodge being there, it's like, I think that they kind of thrust him into a certain role and it, the role worked because they had AJ Brown over the middle of the field. They had DeMarcus Lodge on the other side of the field. Uh, I've, you know, running slants, running go routes, those are pretty easy routes to run, uh, but Metcalf continually gaining separation. It's, it's definitely something that's going to be debated all the way up through. And I know a lot of people actually moved DK Metcalf down their board once they saw the picture of him getting so big, like he looks like a defensive end. But going down the, the list of wide receivers, we have some other ones like Kelvin Harmon from uh, NC State. He's uh, he's high on a lot of boards. One guy that popped up in the news yesterday was Marquise Brown out of Oklahoma. This is Antonio Brown's cousin. He had to have surgery, a Liz Frank surgery. That's a foot injury. That's terrible for a wide receiver. And, you know, especially one that relies on the explosion that he does uh, at five foot ten. And then even Debo Samuel, I'm going to throw him out there out of South Carolina. Some people don't like him. To me, Debo Samuel reminds me a lot of Jarvis Landry. Uh, I feel like he's a guy that's not going to, he's not going to be an alpha wide receiver. He's not going to be that, but he can play a role in the NFL. Uh, we hit on AJ Brown. These are guys that are all expected, I think, to go in the top three rounds, you know, of Calvin Harmon, of Debo Samuel, of Marquise Brown. Is there a, a favorite one you have of those three? I see the talent in all of them. They're all NFL worthy a couple of the guys i'm suspect on why if i was an nfl gm why i would draft them higher than some other guys but to, to hit on them it, i think kelvin Harmon of the group to be is the best if i could only have one of them he would be the one of the three that i would take for nfl and for fantasy uh he, he it's kind of like in that uh butler harry medcalf guy that can go deep makes all the catches it's stunning the amount of you know six foot two and taller guys that can that can make incredible catches downfield but uh, the the x factor i think with Harmon over guys like a Metcalf uh or maybe even butler is he there's a knack uh for kelvin Harmon to get open i don't know how he does he i, I need to study more of the tape to see if, if it's just broken coverage but that guy when you know, Butler makes a lot of contested catches. Metcalf will race past some cornerbacks about once or twice a game and then hope the quarterback puts it on them. Harmon would be open by five and 10 yards. And that's, that's an odd thing to watch on tape. Uh, after all these years of doing it, it, it's, it, it, it's, if it happens once or twice, it's no big, you know, it could be broken covers, but Harmon consistently over and over wide open. So uh, Harmon may have a little bit of an X factor where he just has that thing. That's hard to measure that he has the ability to get open, uh, better than the other bigger wide receivers. So, uh, and in, and in other years, Kelvin Harmon may be, we'd be talking about Harmon as the number one wide receiver in the draft this year but it, it, it with this loaded class you know he, he he's gonna be lucky to be in the top five discussion when we get to the Debo Samuel and I, I like Debo Samuel just fine but if I'm an NFL GM do I draft Debo Samuel at six foot 200 good hands good everything he's just gonna be he's gonna be a solid maybe a Sterling Shepard ish type wide receiver where it's just like it's I, I really like having this guy on my NFL team but I could also go with uh, Emmanuel Hall later in the draft. I mean, if, if Riley Ridley's going to fall in the draft, there's a lot, you know, where's Paris Campbell sitting at? There's a lot of other guys in his range um, and and guys even in the, on day three um, that are just as talented. That's why Debo Samuel is kind of one of the um, players that I think of. And I think of all of the other guys that are just, are, that are good like him, and I think, man, this this wide receiver class is so loaded. Not only do we have all these six foot three, six foot four, and six foot five freaks out there that that can stretch the field and make these great downfield catches, even if that's all they can bring to the table. But then there's a bunch of just professional wide receivers like Debo Samuel. I don't know if Andy Isabella quite fits in that same genre, but Emmanuel Hall, there's just a lot of guys that just know what they're doing. There's, they're physically talented. They've got great hands. They've probably been playing wide receiver in different academies and camps since they were in fourth or fifth grade. You know, they probably played basketball uh, all through high school and everything else. You know, they're just talents. So I like like Debo Samuel, there's a lot of guys uh, I like in that Debo Samuel range, which would then leave me, if I'm looking at Marquise Brown, I'm going, why would I draft Marquise Brown with all this other talent out here? He got the terrible injury. Um, but the thing that gets me on, on Marquise Brown, I don't know that he's, you know, so I've seen a couple, he's like Tyreek Hill. I don't think he's like Tyreek Hill. Uh, 
Uh, but the one thing that always blows me away on Marquise Brown is looking at his um, overall resume. Usually when you get a guy that's small and fast like that and you're, you're called Hollywood and everybody thinks you're a Tyreek and never took a carry. If I remember correctly, never took a carry uh, in at Oklahoma, never returned or a kick or a punt. When you've got freakish speed talents like that in college, that only play wide receiver and the coaches don't seem to put, want to give them the ball. Otherwise uh, to me, that's a little bit of a red flag. Plus now you got the injury red flag. So I don't know what NFL team is going to overdraft him, but he's going to be overdrafted. He's and he's not without talent, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's Tyreek Hill and hiding or any other type of. Uh, what about Paris Campbell out of Ohio state? Is he someone that could be used in a, in a way that Tyreek Hill is, you know, he's, he's not, he's not big, but th- this kid's a burner. Crazy speed. I, I tweeted out yesterday that uh, if if he winds up on the Packers taking that Randall Cobb slot role, I'm going to buy him everywhere. Yeah, and I think the the note I always come back to on Paris Campbell, and he he confuses me. I don't know if he's an A or a C grade, and I think if he lands with Aaron Rodgers, all of a sudden he's an <laughs> yeah. A. And if he lands with Deshaun Kaiser because Aaron Rodgers got hurt, then he's a, an F. <laughs> um, I think he's just another one of those guys like Debo Samuel. Like you put, if he takes the role, you know, if he's with the Packers or he's with the Rams or whoever you want to place him with, that gives him some juice. We'll be like, wow, that guy, what a great pick. And then there's going to be guys that wind up on, you know, old Jacksonville, and you're like, oh, that guy, what a terrible draft pick. I think what Campbell is going to be, as I watched him, I never saw, wow, generational talent. Wherever he goes, the game is going to change. Uh, I just thought he's really talented. I'm, I'm interested to see if he's as fast as people say, but I think a lot of it's going to be on his what quarterback he winds up with. So I think he's hovering right in that. He's going to break strong one way or the other for fantasy. He's going to he's going to land on you know Buffalo, and we're going to be like, see you later. And he, or he lands on Green Bay, as you say, and we're like top five guy. <laughs> Pretty much, that's exactly where he'd start moving towards. But yeah, th- I think that's a, a lot of the players. You know, like when we talk about that, we talked about with running backs. I think it's the same with wide receivers. Like if DK Metcalf were to go to Buffalo, he would not be drafted as a top five wide receiver. They're too heavily invested in Josh Allen for me to like DK Metcalf as a number one wide receiver then so it's like landing spots do matter so understand that but this is more to give you an idea as to what these players are and a Paris Campbell is that utility knife that you know he's quick and he actually is pretty intelligent when it comes to reading his own defense there were there were little things that I saw him do in his games like subtle things um, that I really did enjoy another player that pops up on that like every time I'm like why aren't people higher on this guy why and I ever, like and I, and I go to the next game thinking okay it was just one game I go to the next game and I think the same exact thing David David Sills, tell me that you don't like, I mean, if you don't like him, tell me, I mean, cause I'm, I'm just thunderstruck basically by people talking, like not talking enough about this kid. I just feel like, you know, he's, he's somewhat lanky, 6'3", 203 pounds is what he's listed at. Uh, but there's so many things he does well. He's a very technically sound wide receiver, excellent hands. He can play anywhere in the field. I, I just don't see what's not to like. I like his game, but I would be concerned from the NFL terms. It's 20, 2019 and into the future, this, this could be a real fantasy changing NFL changing type of draft starting with this year going forward that we have to throw out a lot of our studies of the past. We can go back and go, Oh, you know, wide receivers don't break until their third year. Oh, this, that, and the other, there, we have never seen a time in the NFL, at least at my time where there is so much talent flooding in that it's going to change who gets targets? You know, a lot of these top guys from this particular draft at wide receiver aren't probably aren't going to find homes where they're jammed into the starting lineup right away. Uh, or if they are jammed in the starting lineup, they're they're across from uh, you know they're across from Devontae Adams if they line if they wind up on Green Bay if they're the number two if D- DK Metcalf's across from Devontae Adams that would never happen because they got three other guys like him, but where where they land there's there's not a lot of places left of you know oh what a great landing spot or oh they're so talented they're just going to shove everybody else aside and be the number one a lot of these guys are going to be coming in as the number two number three target guy so from a fantasy perspective we can love a lot about these guys but there's going to be so much talent it's going to be who the quarterback is who the head coach is what the offensive coordinator is up to it's a shame because a lot of these guys are talented and they and they wind up on the wrong team and 
everybody forgets about them in a couple of years and it costs them a lot of money where like a DK Metcalf, for example, to me, he's not, he, he doesn't deserve to be number one with a bullet ahead of a lot of these guys, but he's going to get drafted high. He's going to get a lot of money. He's going to get a lot of opportunity. And there's going to be other guys, maybe David Sills that are technically better and, but they're going to get drafted later. They're going to be uh, maybe the f- number four, number five wide receiver. They'll be forgotten. It's going to cost them a lot of money just in, you know, image and uh, where they can possibly go. So every, this it's going to be hard to 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 picture what fantasy is going to be like in another year or two with all this wide receiver talent. I say all that as a lead into Davis Sills, and if we're talking four or five years ago, we're probably like, look at that crafty, tall wide receiver, six four. You know, put a little bit of meat on his bones with those hands. Yeah, man, we're going to love him. Then you get to 2019, you're like, wow. There's he's six four. That's like I, there's five other guys I like that are six four that that are more athletic that are probably going to be able to run away from coverage more. You know, so David Sills to me he's a he's a fine wide receiver. He's in the wrong year to get super excited about. He he has to land perfect with a very meticulous quarterback who can make him work for fantasy purposes and NFL purposes. Could be Tom Brady in the. Patriots, but I think there's so many other guys that are his now that are his size, height wise, but they're also bigger. They're he's like close to 200 pounds, 204, I think, 205. There's other guys that are, that are his size that are 220, 225. They're going to have big verticals and everything else that are going to be more eye pleasing, catching you know uh, weapons that that just call to us where David Sills is going to be have a very narrow tract of being the the reliable route running guy and he, it's going to, he's going to have to hit into the with the right quarterback that can throw to tight windows and who's going to go out of their what, what team is going to go out of their way to draft Sills and go hey look everybody Sills is starting and we really need to get him ready and working with the number one quarterback to get him to be the quarterback's best friend I, I don't think Sills is ever going to get that chance I think he, five years ago he might this current era, I think Sills is going to end up getting forgotten, buried on a roster, never get to work with the number one quarterbacks. He's going to work with sloppy quarterbacks that aren't going to help his particular game, and he's going to get lost in the NFL. Unfairly so, but I guess the new era of way too much talent now hitting at wide receiver. So you have to have either some name appeal, have gone to Alabama, done something to get that attention, or just, just land in a perfect spot to get a chance. So, Oh man, I'm really hoping you're wrong on that one. I, I do. Cause I mean, I just, I hope for him because he deserves it. I hope for him, he gets that um, opportunity. So are you low on Riley Ridley then six two, 200 pounds? No, I, I'm, I'm more, why did, why did everybody assume Calvin Ridley was number one in the class with a bullet? And then here's a, a clone and we think, yeah, you know, maybe he's top five, probably more top 10, of course, he's up here because of his brother's name. That's my first thought was, of course, he's up there because of who his brother is. But then you watch him play and you're like, that guy's damn good. <laughs> Riley Ridley, Ridley, the last name because of Calvin Ridley, because he went to Georgia and SEC. He, he'll get more opportunity than David Sills is going to and probably unfairly so. But I, I like both of them. I like Riley Ridley's game for the NFL and for fantasy a little bit more. Uh, I think it'll be, he has an opportunity to be like Calvin, a little bit more electric uh, for fantasy. But I generally like Ridley. I, I mean, like I like I like route runners. Riley Ridley is he's good. I don't get the same feeling as I did when I watched Calvin Ridley. I feel like Calvin Ridley was the best route runner that I had watched last year. And it wasn't really all that close for me. Riley Ridley. I do feel like he I don't feel like there's a technician in this class. I don't feel like there's an Amari Cooper that I can watch. And I'm like, oh, my God, this guy is a he will create yards of separation just by the way he uses his feet. And Riley Ridley may be the best route runner in this class. I don't know if I want to go that high yet. I'm still like, we're still very, very early in the process. And, you know, watching them at the combine side by side, you're going to see a lot of that stuff because uh, your eyes can trick you at times. But Riley, Riley Ridley is, he's interesting to me. Um, the, the size six to 200 pounds, it, the, the 200 pounds does worry me a little bit, um, but it didn't worry me with Calvin Ridley because he, he was able to gain separation. He was able to stop on a dime. Ridley, 
there are things about his game that I do really like. And again, we're going to dig deeper into all of these wide receivers uh, as we go further into the offseason. We only got uh, so much time left here. Give me one name before we move on to quarterbacks uh, that you like as a day three sleeper at wide receiver. Before I hit the day three one, you were talking about technicians at wide receiver. I would just say the guy that can get open at will, the, the master craftsman of this draft class, the guy who's probably technically the best wide receiver, except for he's going to have a hard time finding the right home and getting used properly is Andy Isabella from UMass. He is by far the best technician to me in this class, but he he's like a better Julian Edelman, only that that job is taken, and where else are you going to go be Julian Edelman? No other NFL team has really been able to, to use the Edelman-Welker type of role like the Patriot, like Tom Brady has been able to. So I love Ez- Isabella as the most crafty, but there's a lot of guys that I think, this again, this class is loaded. The wide receiver sleeper for me for fantasy – is uh, is a little bit of a wild card. Jalen Hurd from a Baylor. Yeah, here's another six foot four, you know, two hundred and fifteen, two hundred twenty pound uh, wide receiver. So he's a big wide receiver. Ken Kett, but he was also he also started out at Tennessee and ran for. 1200 yards i think his sophomore season in the sec for tennessee uh as a six foot three six foot four running back so he then he gets hurt he kind of loses his job in a timeshare he uh graduate transfers i think to baylor um and last so last year was his first and only year playing for baylor converted from running back to wide receiver because of his size and they used him as a number one big guy wide receiver while at the same time would then pull him into the backfield. And I think I'm going off a of memory here. He might've had 50, 60 catches and 50, 60, 70, 80 carries. He's like a giant Tyreek Hill in a sense uh, at running, but he's not he's nowhere near as fast as Tyreek Hill, but there's a, there's, there's a guy that exists that ran for a thousand yards in the sec as a sophomore and then turn around and is a six foot three, six foot four capable plus wide receiver talent what a unique thing that to, to that could come to an NFL team, a guy that you could, you know, line up at tailback, then split him out as a, as a real flanker, as a, you know, a, mitch, a mismatch nightmare. If you started him out at running back and then moved him into wherever you moved him to, who's going to cover him? You have to shift everybody around or you start him out at wide receiver and all of a sudden you pull him back into the backfield and, you know, your hand in this six foot four, he'd be one of the, he's, he'd be one of the biggest running backs in this class. And he's one of the biggest wide receivers in this class. And he's, he's played both roles successfully so the the most interesting wide receiver from a fantasy perspective if he's lands in the right place and the team can see it and uses them to me is Jalen Hurd there you go you made an interesting case on that one all right with that being said we need to move over to quarterbacks this we're gonna have to do it really quick here so I want you to make a case everybody knows that this quarterback class is it's considered one of the weaker ones that we've seen in quite some time and there's you know I still think we're probably going to see we're going to see at least three quarterbacks drafted in the first round if not four of them Um, I want you to make the case for one quarterback like who have you watched and you're like he's a first round talent he's a guy that should go in the first round or the closest thing to it give me your guy to keep it quick and to put a bow on it fast All of these quarterbacks, except for Kyler Murray, are completely uninteresting for fantasy purposes, and it's a weak year for fantasy quarterbacks outside of Kyler Murray. So if I was going to make the case for a guy that wasn't Kyler Murray, I think Jared Stidham is the best pure pocket talent in the draft, but I don't think he's got enough draft uh, stock status. He's not going to be drafted to start. He's going to be drafted to to back up and have to work his way up. So that's not going to be very exciting. Uh, I think most of these uh, other quarterbacks that aren't Kyler Murray are destined to be mediocre quarterbacks at best. Maybe a Gardner Minshew ends up being poor man's Baker Mayfield somewhere. But the whole other lot of them, I don't believe in. I think Dwayne Haskins is wildly overrated. I think Daniel Jones is a fraud. I think Drew Locke is a, is a Josh Allen type fraud. I thought Will Greer had a little something, but boy, he looked terrible uh, during the Senior Bowl week. Or not terrible, just disinterested. It's not a, an aggression. And Ryan Finley's nice. You know, maybe he's a Matt Ryan someday. Uh, would he, he could have been a Matt Ryan ten years ago, but this year he's just kind of another quarterback. So I don't really care for any of these quarterbacks from a fantasy perspective except for Kyler Murray and then that's only where does he land up and how do they use him to me I mean, Kyler Murray could could change the landscape of fantasy if he's drafted into a place and jammed into the starting lineup like the Arizona Cardinals take him number one and move Josh Rosen and I don't think that's going to happen but if that were to happen that would change everything I mean that would be 
massive. But if he winds up I don't, on the Patriots, then goodbye. I forget it. You know, he's going to be behind Brady for another couple of years. He's going to be a gimmick. Yeah, I think you're going to see him on like one of a few teams. And I think he's going to be starting right away. I don't think a team's going to draft him in the first round to, to let him sit. I think you might see the Redskins come into play uh, with Alex Smith having to miss the season if he lasts that long. The Dolphins, they're a team that's no, that people are talking about them tanking this year. Uh, they're going to let Ryan Tannehill go. I mean, you know, we have to see where some of these free agent quarterbacks fall. Ryan Fitzpatrick, that's a stopgap thing. You know, you're going to see Nick Foles land with the team. Is it the Jaguars? Is there a trade to be made between the Eagles and the Jags? I don't know. Um, but you know, the Drew Locke thing, I, I'm going to stand up for Drew Locke for a second. I'm not a big fan of Drew Locke. Um, he's actually my number two or number three, depending on the day, uh, w- quarterback in this class. So I'm not a huge fan of him, but I, I would take him over Josh Allen. Josh Allen, uh, Locke's arm is obviously the, you know, the strongest point of his game, but the accuracy is more on point than, than I saw with Josh Allen. Josh Allen, I still don't like, and I understand that he, he became a fantasy asset down the stretch, but, uh, you know, watching him on, on film, uh, just go back and watch it. I mean, I, I understand he wrecks you up fantasy points, but if you actually sit down and watch quarterbacks throw the football, he's just not very good. Um, and, you know, the Bills, unfortunately, now they're tied to him. And that's the thing is that's why it's like if a wide receiver goes to the Bills and they're going to draft one, it's just a matter of who. I'm not going to like him nearly as much. I mean, this is a guy that even when he wasn't pressured at all, like when he had a clean pocket, no pressure at all. He completed, I think it was 61 or 62% of his passes last year. That's not good at all. I don't know how else to say that. There's quarterbacks that do that. You know, their completion rate is higher than that with everything included. So this is a relatively weak quarterback class. Kyler Murray depends on where he goes. You know, you could see the Raiders, I guess, draft him, but I don't, I don't see it happening. I really don't see the Raiders doing it. I think they're going to ride with Derek Carr. I don't think the Cardinals are going to take him at number one. I think that's a lot of smoke and mirrors. I think they're taking Bosa. And if they don't take Bosa, I think they're trading back, but let's go to tight ends to wrap up this episode because quarterbacks, they really aren't going to have much fantasy impact until we find out where they go. And honestly, quarterbacks usually take time to develop to become a reliable fantasy asset. And as you mentioned, Kyler Murray is hands down the number one dynasty quarterback. If you need to draft one and if you're having a draft before, you know, the NFL draft takes place, Kyler Murray's the one with his, uh, his mobility. But tight ends is known, again, this is another position that's known as the cream of the crop. Like this is a great tight end class. My favorite one, and I don't, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, it's, it's not the consensus. Uh, the consensus is TJ Hawkinson. A lot of people like him out of Iowa. And I do think that he's a well-rounded tight end. I like Irv Smith out of Alabama. And I know you said that you have to put, put, you know, all the uh, Alabama players, but he's someone that, you know, a lot of the Alabama players, I do end up walking away and saying, I think they're a little bit overrated, particularly like a Mac Wilson on defense. I'm not a big fan, but When watching Irv Smith, you know, knowing that his dad played in the NFL, knowing that his dad was a first round pick, like there's athleticism in his genes. And with the way that the tight end position is used nowadays, I feel like he fits it all. He can play all over the field. He can block, unlike Noah Fant. You know, what's your take on these top tight ends and do you have a favorite one? As you were saying that, thinking about the tight ends and then after we transition from the quarterbacks, you know, the quarterbacks are are just like we're starting to talk about the wide receivers and the running backs. We got, you know, we got talented guys coming in and it's like, where are they going to go? You know, who even needs a quarterback? And if you do, you got Foles and Fitzpatrick. And I mean, there's guys out there to be had to place, you know, Teddy Bridgewater. There's guys to be placed in there. Plus, you know, now team's number two quarterbacks are, you know, starter level worthy. So, I mean, the NFL just keeps changing so fast and guys can hit fast, just like Baker Mayfield. You know, if there's, if it's the right talent, uh, a Baker Mayfield or, you know, Dak Prescott, Patrick Mahomes, if he would have started year one, uh, would have been great too. And obviously it was great last year. There, there's, there's some whirlwind talent coming from college into the NFL that's changing everything this year at, outside of, of Kyler Murray uh, because of the, what the unorthodox style that he brings. I don't think there's any of those type of guys uh, coming, but there's a lot of capable guys. So it's just a more flood of talent coming in. But then you go to tight end. I don't think we've seen the tight end flood uh, just yet, which I think you guys were talking about last podcast I listened to. I don't know whose point brought it up about tight ends being so valuable and how you're going to, you'd be looking in the draft a tight end in the first couple rounds. Oh, Bobby is uh, all about drafting a tight end in the first two rounds. I think that's been a uh, worthy debate for a couple of years now, just because there hasn't been the flood of wild and unique tight ends 
like there has been in all of the other positions. It's probably coming. I thought it would be happening faster, but this class has got some good tight ends, but it's not like, oh, there's this flood coming in. To Irv Smith, my Irv Smith argument to people would be, who do you who do you like better? If you could have one tight end right now, one Alabama tight end right now, would you rather have O.J. Howard or Irv Smith? Oh, man, that's, I, I, I guess I'll say O.J. Howard, considering I've seen him do it in the pros, but um, they're comparable players. I, I think they're they're kind of comparable players, but I think we'd all because we all have that inclination that OJ Howard, I think is maybe just a, a hair bigger. It's probably going to maybe be a hair faster. So it kind of places for Irv Smith for me is like okay, he's he's definitely good, but I don't know. He's not the from a fantasy perspective. You know, obviously he's going to have to land right and all that. He's just he's a little lesser. OJ Howard excitement to me. You know, if he runs in the four fours, I'm going to change, you know, I'll change everything. But I think he's going to end up closer to four six. And if he's closer to six three in height, his measurables are going to tell a lot of the story. So I like Irv Smith. Uh, I'm waiting to see if I want to love Irv Smith. But I think because all of our inclinations are, our guts telling us OJ Howard was better, places Irv Smith as good, not wow, elite, great, where from a fantasy perspective, you know, taking the blocking aspect out of it from a fantasy perspective, no offense more if, if, if we're talking fantasy and I could only point it to you right this second, if you could have one for fantasy without knowing what team they were landing on, let's just say, you know, they're going to land in a good spot, both of them and start. Would you take for fantasy Fant or Smith? Yeah. Fant's got to be the guy. I would, I would think that Fant's the guy because I think teams that are drafting him know that he's not much of a blocker and they're taking in and, and he's going to get drafted in the top two rounds. That's going to happen. So if a team's investing a top two round pick in a tight end like him, one that can't necessarily block and plays more of like a possession receiver in a big bodied receiver, receiver at that um I do I do like Fant as a receiver I just don't think his, he's as well-rounded and I think that's why a lot of people have moved him down their boards and put, put Hawkinson above him just because Hawkinson is more of like the uh the traditional you know tight end that can you know run in line he you can line him up out wide he's fast enough to get down the seam um there's a lot of things to like about Hawkinson uh but Fant is more of like the one-trick pony and teams are going to know what they're getting when I'm watching Irv Smith I'm looking at him and I'm going that's a good that's an above average talent tight end, I hope he lands in the right place for fantasy. When I watch Noah Fan, there are moments you can see where you like this this guy's on another level of athleticism and breakaway speed that when I first saw Evan Ingram, I'm like, there's no way this guy is going to make it in the NFL. He, he's not interested in blocking. He's more of a really wide receiver masquerading as a tight end. Ton of credit to him. He came in, he worked on his blocking because he had size uh, and fans got more size than Ingram. Fan, if he can, if he can work on the blocking side or if you just take the blocking side out of the argument, if some of his reported measurables are close to accurate now we're start to enter especially for fantasy into a more of a freak zone of a tight end where Irv Smith I know is just good rock solid good uh isn't going to disappoint you but I don't know that he's an A as much as he's more just a solid B or a B plus Fant has the potential to be an A with the NFL combine is going to I think will confirm some of that to get excited about so that's I'm more interested in Fant from a fantasy perspective because I think in the right place He's just a weapon that nobody's going to be able to cover. Like Evan Ingram has shown the ability to. I don't think Evan Ingram's the greatest tight end from an NFL perspective I've seen for sure. But for fantasy, I'm all about Evan Ingram, uh, and I'm I'm ready to be all about Noah Fant from a fantasy perspective. And then to flip it to his teammate T.J. Hawkinson, to me, it's a crime of the century. Anybody from a fantasy perspective that rates. Uh, Hawkinson above him and I don't know how Hawkinson is a number one ranked tight end over an Irv Smith from an NFL perspective to me TJ Hawkinson's almost like a tall fullback who got thrown into playing some tight end it's like if if you, if you liked Max Williams here's the smaller version with less with you know not as good a hands uh, as Max Williams I think Hawkinson from a NFL perspective is way overrated. And then from a fantasy perspective, he shouldn't even be in the conversation of top guys with these other guys. I think he's one of the, he is, I'll bet he runs four, eight plus four, nine. And that just sweeps his legs out from underneath of him as a draft prospect. He can block. He has decent enough hands. I have no idea how he got the draft stock and status, especially for people rating him over an Alabama guy. I figured the Alabama guy would win by default. So, Well, they're not national champs, so that people naturally are going to bring him down. <laughs> I, I am not a Hawkinson 
guy at all, especially for fantasy. For fantasy, to me, I'd take a thousand other tight ends before I took Hawkinson. Yeah, I, I'm kind of with you to an extent uh, on this one. I, I, I didn't understand why people put him over a few guys. Like, I think I'd rather have Irv Smith. Like, even if I'm drafting, I don't even think from fantasy perspective, I think I'd rather have Irv Smith as a actual NFL, like in the NFL as a team. Um, but when it comes to fan, it really does come down to the offense and how they're going to use him. Are they going to keep him in the block? You know, is a team like the Saints going to go after him in the second round because they could use a tight end? They're, they're a team that's built to win right now. They don't necessarily need help on the offensive line to block. So there's a lot of things that come into play. And, uh, you know, we're going to be covering all those things uh, throughout this offseason and doing a lot more draft coverage. Um, hopefully you guys got a good overview of the NFL draft. You know, we tried to touch on as many players as we can and understand that it's pretty hard, uh, for guys like me and RC to go through them and, uh, just like lightly hit on them without getting into a debate because I would love to sit here and just debate all day long, but we understand your car ride's probably over. And once again, I'd like to thank RC Fisher for coming on to the show. Make sure you guys follow him on Twitter at FF Metrics to see his work leading up to the draft. We are going to be back next week with an NFL Combine primer talking about the things that you should be watching at the Combine. Obviously, we talked about a few of those things today. Man, I am so excited that we are on to the NFL draft season. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. So until next time, lights out. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve